Thank you for just joining in on time, uh, which is our pre-service prayer. I know that there's some uh, college students that are going to uh, campus or whether it's through online uh, schooling. We want to pray for them. We want to remember them, uh, those that are already there uh, for the school season as well. So would you just join in first and foremost that God's presence would be um, acknowledged, welcomed. and revered and responded to with obedience and with glad and sincere hearts that we come before him let's fix our gaze on him let's pray that god would enable us to know that this is a day that the lord has made and that we will rejoice no matter what uh, because this because he reigns and he loves us so much so let's pray together
Secondly, would you pray for yourselves and for one another? Um, it's not just our church, but just church throughout the nation where I'm hearing alarming statistics, and I am not an alarmist. I am not. I like to see things in reality as best as I can. That there is an alarming um, um, statistics that even pastors are not attending church. They're not even engaging in live streaming. If they've resigned or have have stepped down, or the eight thousand seven to eight thousand churches are predicted to close this year and almost every year. Uh, and that when these things happen, uh, you know, I'm I'm hearing in our church that if we don't serve, if we don't have a duty or responsibility or task, that, that we just kind of drop the ball and just kind of coast. And, and what is worship? Is worship about God needing our service first and foremost? He doesn't need our service. He's sovereign. Worship is about being Mary's first before we become Martha's. It's becoming just coming in His presence and enjoying Him, delighting in Him, learning from Him and of Him, and just receiving, really. The giver gets the glory. Always does. And so even if you feel like in the season that you're not doing much, you're not serving, you're not active, it's okay. Don't let that hinder you from coming to engage in live streaming or in person worship. So let's pray, God, repent. We repent that we have to be indispensable or feel this need to be needed. We repent from those things. And that, Lord God, it's, up, it's about you, not about what I can do for you or the church. So if that's you, would you come back to the center and say, God, it's about you. And I'll worship you no matter what, even if I'm paralyzed from neck down and I can't do anything, I will worship you. children, those that are going off to college, those that already went, um, that God would protect them. God would keep them in the narrow path of His will and His purpose for their lives. God would just strengthen from our kindergarten on up, whether it's online, hybrid, or in person, whatever changes or things happen that God would just strengthen our children to thrive in all circumstances for Him and His glory. Let's pray for that.
are you? Hanging in there? Um, I, I thought I saw a note. Is that a note, Kim? Oh, no, it's not. Okay, I thought someone left a note there. So. Just want to welcome those that are checking in online. Uh, for those that uh, may be visiting for the first time, um, welcome to Riverside Family. Uh, my name is Joe, uh, pastor of Riverside Community Church. So glad that you could uh, join us on this Lord's Day. Good to see children in our midst and uh, some new faces as well. Welcome uh, to God's house. Um, we do have a couple of announcements that I want to quickly go over. Um, uh, if you haven't been uh, logging into our Google for your attendance as well as your prayer requests, um, just, just check on your Facebook. You know, everyone's saying good morning RCC, good morning RCC. Just add the number of family members or uh, attendees that are logging in. So just put that and we can just keep track. Um, not to stalk you, but to, you know, we, that's one small way of checking in to see how you're doing uh, during this difficult season. And please add prayer requests. We do lift them up. Um, join for our Wednesday weekly uh, prayer meeting via Zoom, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, this Wednesday and every Wednesday. That's okay. Um, I'll be away. I'll be away from August 31st to September 8th. Uh, just pray for some much needed rest. Where, where do pastors go when, when they cannot come in person? There's no other churches open the door. Uh, I'm going to log in somewhere else. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in and listen to some of my favorite pastors, like Pastor Simbala of Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, there, there's a handful of them out there that is preaching the gospel. So that's my opportunity to... Uh, do so as well. So please pray for just some renewal, much needed rest. Um, RCC um, uh, is scheduled uh, to provide dinner uh, at Family Promise um, Homeless Shelter in Hackensack on September 13th. And as many of you know, there's been just emails left and right the very day that it went out, just a few minutes later. So many people responded, I'll bring a plate of uh, pasta, salad. So we have more than enough uh, so thank you for that uh, response. Um, but on, on September 13th, Jones and a few others, others will be here to put all the uh, plates together. It's kind of like a lunch box so that we don't serve and, and, and um, increase the risk. So if you're here physically, uh, you can help out. Please let Jones know. And also delivery to Hackensack as well. If you want to be part of that, please let Jones know. His email is on, on your Google Doc and Facebook. Um, We've announced this last week, Crown Financial Class is a biblical uh, understanding of God's um, gifts of uh, finance and gifts and talents and how we can faithfully uh, steward that, manage that. Elder Paul, he has taught this class a few times, will be leading this class. It's from September 7th to uh, November 9th, and uh, it's going to require weekly two-hour Zoom meetings and weekly homework for 10 weeks uh, on, and today happens to be the deadline. Uh, so please, I encourage you, ask couples to do this together so that you can be on the same page about how to manage God's finance in your life. His email is there, RSVP to him. Um, again, just when we're done, just uh, um, do linger a little bit and, and catch up with one another and just exit to your left, to my right, uh, through that door. If you need to re use a restroom, you can go through. You don't have to go all, all the way around. It's a big block. So you can go straight to the restroom downstairs and, and do so. Um, again, just thank you for your continued sacrificial giving of tithes and offerings. And um, we will uh, pray for that at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your church that is more than, that is much more, much, much more than a building, a place where we gather. But nevertheless, your church is the members of the body of Christ, believers grafted into the covenant of, with Israel, where we congregate, where we gather together in some physical space that, that you're, you promised where two or more are gathered, I will be present. So we know that you are in our midst as Emmanuel God. We ask that you would meet us here, speak to us, comfort us and fortify us. Lord, as, as uh, John Wesley said, our task as a church is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort those who are afflicted. I pray that your word would do the same. It will be like a double-edged sword. We'll continue to reveal our innermost being 
and make us, Lord, right with you. If we're drifting, would you bring us back? God, we pray for um, just your provision for your people. You know what your children are going through, and you're faithful to provide. So God, see your church through, that we may not just survive and meet our needs, but to be able to give in generosity, to spread your word in word and in deed. Be with us during this time. I ask for your strength to preach your word faithfully, that the hearts will be good soil, from children on up to adults, that it will land and yield and bear much fruit of obedience and a life that's set apart for you. To that end, Lord, be glorified during this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me. Um, it's a long passage, and, and, I, and I, my guess is this, that sometimes that in our busyness that we don't get to read chunks of the Bible, but some, you know, little, um, not, nothing wrong with that, a daily devotional, one page, like three, four paragraph, and we're so in a rush that even that is needed, but sometimes we really need to feast upon the Word of God, read chunks at a time, and, and just in an unhurried way, let it sink, let it, let it just deposit into our hearts until it does something. Uh, and so uh, it's a long passage, but this is one of my, uh, my favorite passage about this mysterious prophet named Balaam. And we're going to read Revelation first and the Old Testament background to understand our New Testament passage for today. Listen now to God's word. From Revelation 2, verses 12 to 17, and from Numbers 22, 1 to 32, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, you have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrifice to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, I will also give him a white stone with the new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Now, Numbers 22, 1 to 32, this is the background of what the teaching of Balaam might be referring to. It is referring to. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan of, at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was in great dread of the people because there were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam the son of Beor at at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of, of Emma, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and dry them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their land. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent, me to, sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and dry them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. 
So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak's and princes, more in number and more honorable than these, and they came to Balak and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey, donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her, her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with the wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you, because your way is perverse before me. This is God's word. Balaam the talking donkey, I'm sure those of us who grew up in Sunday school have heard this talking donkey. And, um, but the teaching of Balaam was infiltrating this church in Pergamum. And this church, Jesus says, is, is um, living, is situated in a place where the stronghold or the throne of Satan dwells. What a description of a town or a city. Satan's throne is there. Not only is Satan's throne there, he dwells there, he lives there, he resides there. Can you imagine if God, if Jesus were to say, I know where you live. In one of the towns in Bergen County is where there's a, a Satanist church. Church means just a gathering, and there are churches of Satan too. And says that this town is called the Lucifer town. It's a stronghold of Satan. There's law and order on the surface, but there's some creepy things going on. And that church and the people who follow Satan to worship him. But I know that you also reside there and there's a lot of pressure there to compromise your faith. But I thank you, just like Antipas who stood his ground for his faith in Christ and was killed. You've been faithful. So this church is being praised by Jesus for being faithful. That they're not compromising. But then Jesus, like, you know, he's giving assessment to all these seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. But he says, I have this against you. You, some of you, hold to the teaching of Balaam, the prophet. And I, you know, sometimes, like, these people knew what Balaam's story. I didn't have to read that whole Old Testament story. They knew exactly what John was talking about with that when you were holding on to the teaching of Balaam. But some of us don't, so that's why I read it. And you're also holding on to the teaching of Nicolaitans. These were two really false teachings that was infiltrating the camp. 
that on the one hand, there were a handful of people in this church staying loyal like Antipas. Remember last week I said the word martyr, the word witness means a martyr. So to bear testimony to who Jesus is and his ways and his truth is simultaneous of being willing to lay down your life. And he says, I praise you because Antipas is one of your great examples. But I have this against you. Some of you are compromising. My message is entitled, Do Not Compromise. Some of you are compromising and, and, and following, to the, following the false teachings of Balaam and also the Nicolaitans. And the two things that I want to highlight in this passage is, are those two things. Um, the false teachings of Balaam and the false teaching of Nicolaitans, which is really one and the same. It really is. When we read in verses 14 and 16, Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, the king of Moab, to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them meaning against you, those that hold on to these false teachings with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is introduced in this early church as someone who has a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Right, remember that? You know, that this Jesus is, is doing an assessment and walking in the midst of them, and, and he's got this, there's a picture of him that John sees, and he's got two, he's got a sword, this double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. What does that mean? It's a sword of judgment, a sword of judgment. You see, the pro-council during this early Christian times had the authority to kill with the sword. They had this authority of the sword, it was called to kill any Christians that would refuse to worship the emperor, the uh, Caesars of the time, because emperor worship was the law. And all these Christians were running around saying, no, Jesus is Lord. And so, so the proconsuls had the authority to slay them on the spot or put them in prison and torture them and so on. That was the reality. And when John says, there's someone in your midst with the double-edged sword, means that there's someone in whom we must fear more than the proconsuls, more than the Roman soldiers, more than Caesar. What does that mean? Really? Fear Jesus? What the, I thought Jesus was a gentle shepherd. I thought the picture that we see of Jesus oftentimes is him uh, carrying a, shep, a sheep on his shoulders, and, and um, you know, he's got blonde hairs and blue eyes, and uh, he looks so calm and handsome and although he looks more like a Middle Eastern, dark-skinned uh, uh, Palestinian. But the picture that American Christianity has drawn up and caricatured is this meek and nice and gentle Jesus. So when we look at these pictures of Jesus in all of his fullness, we're shocked by it. Wait a minute, how could Jesus be the judge? How can Jesus talk more about hell, which is really true, than heaven in the Bible. But we dismiss those things. We have, we have engaged in selective listening, selective believing, selective obedience as well. Things that are easy and relevant, things that feel like it's popular to do, we engage in those. But things that are kind of uncomfortable, we avoid, sweep under the rug. It was Jesus who told his disciples who were afraid during that time to lose their lives. This is what he said to them in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul that lives eternally. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Whoa, did Jesus say that? Yes, he did. If you have a red letter Bible, it's in red. Because Jesus said that. Don't, don't fear those who can just kill, merely kill the body. But fear God who can kill your body and your soul in hell in eternity, separated from him. What does that mean? Do you think if you were one of Jesus' followers and you heard that, you, you felt comfortable? You might think, oh gosh, you're putting fear in my, in my mind and my heart. 
am I to follow you, Jesus, out of fear? So that, like, like you're this cosmic police officer in heaven that if I stray, you're just going to ticket me and punish me? Is that what Jesus wants? Obviously not. Because Jesus, to his followers, what he was trying to say this was this, and this is related to the message at hand. Jesus was saying, I'm the resurrection and the life. If someone kills your body, they can't kill your soul. You're going to live eternally with me, and you're, you're going to have a new body fit for he- heaven, made for eternity, and you're going to resurrect in bodily form. So don't be afraid of them. In other words, there are objects of fear in our life that are not worthy of our fear and submission and our yielding and timidity. There are a lot of objects in our life that want your fear, that want your caving into, that want your submission and your obedience, that want to alter your life. You know, coronavirus is one thing that a lot of people are operating out of fear, and because of that, it's just such a big thing that just dictates everything we do. Perhaps it's slander of your friends. You go to school, you get bullied, you're just afraid of this one bully. You know, cyberbullying and all this stuff is out, and, I, and, I, and I'm just so disgusted about what kids do these days in, in that bullying. Perhaps you're afraid of them. Perhaps you're afraid of your boss or others that will ridicule you, gossip behind your back, and because you're a Christian, you, they think you're weird and strange. And Jesus says, don't fear those people. They can could, they could harm your reputation. They can harm, you know, your finance, not make you promoted and, and stuff like that. But fear God. In other words, only have the right fear for the right object, who is God. And when we fear God, we will not fear anyone else. But fear God not in such a way that, you, that it's this unhealthy kind of fear, where God is this cosmic police that's going to put you in jail and like make you suffer and torment you. No, not that kind of fear, but a healthy, reverential fear. Because the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. So the love that God has for us is a perfect love that died for you and me, that he took the double-edged sword upon the cross so that, so that we don't have to be punished for our sins. And in that awe, in that reverential, healthy fear, Fear God, who has redeemed you. And it's because of that gospel truth that Antipas was willing to lay down his life. It, be, it was because of that gospel truth that many Christians were able to lay down their lives. And it's the same gospel that some of the Christians in the church in Pergamum has been straying from adopting and adhering to the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of Nicolaitans, which is really similar one and the same. And the two false teachings or two false belief systems that I want to highlight that I believe is relevant for our times is this. Number one, the end justifies the means. That's false teaching number one. The end justifies the means. What, the, what is that about? I mean, not a lot of us know. That the end, whatever that your end goal in life is, happiness, wealth, fame, money, glory, achievements, then to get to that end, whatever it takes to get to that end, whatever means, whatever it takes to get to that end, it's justifiable. It's okay. In other words, I, I've told this story about this one Christian during Rutgers days. I was a pastor nearby who got a 4.0. That was his goal. That was his end, to graduate in engineering, electrical engineering with a 4.0. He got it. But he confessed to me after his graduation, Pastor Joe, I, there's one big regret in my life. I cheated several times because I so wanted to achieve my end and graduate with the 4.0. He regretted it. But you know what? We live in a society and culture where a lot of people don't regret it. If I want to make money, I'm going to cheat, cheat on taxes, cut corners. I'm going to make money, whatever it takes, as long as I don't do something so flagrant, so blatant that I don't go to jail in the process. If I want to get into good school, I'm going to cheat. If I want to get good grades, yeah, I'll cut corners. And people don't care anymore. And, and um, this belief system that the end justifies the means is rampant even in the church. 
If you want to save people, let's entertain them. Churches are dwindling, so let's, let's bring a circus act. Let's bring people who are on a tight rope and will come in. I, I've seen churches like that, where it's like an entertainment. They have like kiss concert of smoke and light, and they do everything to titillate and entertain. And someone says, if you try to entertain people to come to the church, you have to continue to entertain them. And the cost of following Jesus Christ is so watered down that it becomes not Christianity, but just eanity, right? I talked about that, just eanity. Diluted version that is no gospel at all. What happened to Balaam is that he lost, what happened to him, that he lost all conscientiousness and fear of God in thinking that the end justifies the means. A gifted prophet, a mysterious figure in the Old Testament, God entrusted him with this secret, with this gift of of knowing his thoughts, knowing his secrets, and, and God trusted him so much that he said, Balaam, whoever you bless, I'll bless. Whoever you curse, I'll curse. But Israel never. God, is, he, Israel is my people. You never touch them. Never curse them. But what happened? What happened in the process was Moab, Balak, the king of Moab, said, Israel is too many in number. I must hire this international famous prophet who is known to curse people and God curses. So he sent noble men with gold and silver and said, knocked on his door, Balaam, are you that famous prophet? You're that amazing person that prophesizes. Our king Balak has sent us all these gifts. Would you come with us and curse Israel for us? Balak says no. He says no. Although he says something like, let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. How could you pray about something that is flagrantly and blatantly against God's will and purpose? It's a quick prayer. He prays about it. He comes back and says, God says no, and I I can't go with you. So they go home and tell Balak, and Balak is kind of upset. So he sends men and women, statesmen maybe, more noble, more, more prestigious with greater um, credentials and more gold, more silver and knocks on his door again. Our leader wants you. We want to hire you. And you would think that in his mind he's fixed. God has said no. But he says again, let me pray about it. Wow. Have you ever done that? Where you know that a certain path or a certain way you know it's clearly a red flag, clearly not right before God's eyes. And you said, let me pray about this. If I get this, if I accept this bonus and uh, get promoted, that means I, I'm not going to be able to work, uh, I'm not going to be able to come to church, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to spend less, less time with my family. But God, let me, but let me just pray about it because it's so tempting, it's so enticing. And you pray about it. You want it so much. You've been dying for a promotion. You've been dying for a raise so that you can buy your dream home. You can buy your dream car. You've been so intensely desirous of the American dream or whatever form or shape that your dream may be that when you say, I'll pray about it, it's just a religious jargon. It's just a euphemism to say, Lord, would you just baptize my desire? Would you just put a stamp of approval? That instead of hearing God's no, shouting at you, no, 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 you hear, yes, 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 because that's what you want so much. And that's what was happening in Balaam's mind. I remember um, uh, in one of my uh, posts, uh, church posts, and there was a, uh, another, another church, bigger, you know, more sizable, where the pastor and one of their deacons, uh, once a year, at least once a year, would, would call me or, or, um, or, yeah, call me and say, would you uh, quit your church and come to our church? We'll give you more money, more benefits. I was young, younger, still young now, <laughs> younger. Um, and um, I said, no, no. I mean, initially I was flattered. I was flattered because I wasn't even a popular pastor. I, I was like, really? I, didn't, I wasn't a popular speaker, popular pastor, nothing. So initially I was flattered, but, but I knew in my heart of hearts that God wanted me at this post, at that particular church. And I said, no. But four years straight, once a year, they would call, Have you, can you pray about it? 
And I said, no, I'm not going to pray about this. I'm sorry. I gave them a firm no because there was nothing to pray about. Because God had given me a clear sign that I need to be faithful at my current post. People of God, what are you praying about? You see, our intentions and our desires, the Bible says our heart is deceitful of all things. That we are depraved. That when we talk about how we have a belief system that becomes our God, where we try to synchronize God's teachings and our own belief system, just like Balaam, who knew the Israel's God, who knew God's law, but he decided to have a belief system that somehow maybe there's some loopholes in God's law. Somehow I can still get that bribe, secure my retirement plan because this offer is too good to turn down. And so what he's thinking in his mind is this. I will not curse Israel directly, but let me entice the Moabites. Let me me deceive them to deceive the Israelites to engage in sexual immorality with the women of Moab, and then in turn they will commit idolatry. And then the curse of God will come down. That's what he did, basically. I will not disobey God directly. But let me try to disobey him indirectly so I can wash my hands from guilt and sin. Eventually, God's people were deceived by Balaam's advice to Balak. God's judgment came upon them, and Balaam, one of the prophets, also died in that same judgment. People of God, I mentioned this story once where the founder of World Vision, it's kind of like Compassion International, where this man just wanted to save the world from poverty and stop hunger at all costs, literally almost at all costs. He was so busy traveling the world to feed the poor, to mobilize nations and churches, that he neglected his family so much that his wife eventually divorced him. His daughter that begged him in a letter, come home, I need to be with you, I miss you, sorry, I have another mission, another project. She eventually committed suicide. People of God, I know that's extreme, but we sacrifice sometimes our family, our marriages, our loved ones on the altar of our own success, on the altar of our own happiness, on the altar of our pride and our drivenness. And we say, I prayed about it, though. God, what did you do? And then we start blaming God when God has said, no, no, no. The end doesn't justify the means. We better make sure that the means also is acceptable and pleasing to God. The end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, not only in this life, but in the life to come. If that is the end, to honor God, to fear Him, to glorify Him, the means is to obey Him is to follow him on that narrow path of no compromise. That's what was happening in this church and is happening in the churches in America. Watch Netflix, American Christianity. Watch that this week if you have Netflix. American Christianity that has turned Christianity into a moral betterment. How can I make myself good, better, and great? It's really that. American Christianity is all about that. It's all about you. Obey so God can bless you. Serve Him so that you can have a bigger house. American Christianity is not a Christianity or gospel at all. And it's infiltrating the church like never before, where we treat God like a genie. Secondly, and it's related to this, second false belief system says assimilate in order to get ahead assimilate in order to get ahead in our lives assimilate that's what Balaam was doing that's what some of the Christians in Pergamon was doing the pressure is too much I want to become like everyone else these are chameleon lizard like Christians who always kind of blend in to fit in a certain crowd. Let me fit in to this crowd. Let me fit into what's relevant, hip, so I can appear woke, 
Man, that's a new term, right? So I can be woke. I can be an authentic, relevant Christian. So we have many Christians, especially young and zealous Christians who advocate for mercy and social justice. They're so vocal in their blogs and in their churches. And I'm not coming down on, on them in, a, in a, like a judgmental way, but it's, this is something that I read and, re, and, assess, and I'm assessing as well. A lot of young believers so passionate about social justice and, and, and rights of the immigrants and the poor and the orphans, and it's so good. It's so relevant. You could have a platform now if that's your passion and that's the work that you engage in, but these same Christians are so silent when it comes to things like abortion, when there's millions and millions of babies being slaughtered in the womb, we are so quiet and silent about that. Why? Because your platform will be crumbled if you talk about those kind of issues. You'll be a pure, narrow-minded, arrogant. Who are you to speak against women's right? You're men? Really? Seriously? And they'll shut you out as being irrelevant with the times and intolerant and bigoted. Yet the reason why the Canaanites and Hittites and the Hivites and all these tribes were being driven out of the promised land was because they were slain and sacrificing their children on the altar. And God says to Israel, you do the same. I'll spit you out also from the promised land. And God did. He had to send them into Babylon, send them into Syria and so forth. Christians are not called to be Relevant, and I'm not saying that we can, we can be champions of every cause and everything. That's not my point. But I think we select certain things to be passionate about. We select certain things to obey because it's safer, because it's easier, because we can still gain the world's respect and still somehow think that we can still love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's like oil and water cannot mix and God sees it so we assimilate to get ahead but in God's eyes you're going backwards and sometimes we have to draw a line in the sand and say no you know uh, another popular thing these days is even Christians majority a lot of Christians are cohabiting we're dating uh, we're, we're engaged you know we know it's a done deal so they live together and some of them actually sincerely pray about it. God, can we live together? We're engaged. You, you know our hearts. We'll sleep on different bed and different rooms so we're not tempted. Really? Are you Superman? Are you, are you from Mars? You're not going to be tempted if you're in the same room? And you have to pray about that? No, those are just some, some really black and white things. Like, Lord, Lord God, is it, is it okay for me to smoke weed and get high? Unless it's medical purpose and doctor prescribes it and it's legit. I mean, like, really? Do you have to pray about that? God, is it, is it okay to gamble? Is it okay to get drunk? And those are things that God has explicitly said, no. But we pray about it. We assimilate. And this church was called to repent. You know, we live in a time, it's just, un, un, you know, we use the word unprecedented, and in some ways it is, some ways it's not. There's been, you know, the Black Plague and the, so many other kind of pandemic stuff throughout the world, throughout history. And it's just in America, it's kind of unique because there's so much uh, partisanship and division in our society. and. Um, uh, and so even in the church, we, we're seeing it more. Even in, amongst the Christian leadership, people are just falling because of sexual scandals and financial scandals. And, and I wonder that the world is looking to, our, to the churches and so-called evangelicals and Christians are saying, really, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. I'm, I don't want anything to do with church. I believe that's what's happening. It was, it was Gandhi who said, I, I like their Christ, but I don't like those Christians. I like Christ, you know. I'm practicing his teaching of nonviolence, but those British Christians that came to exploit my country, I, 
they're weird. They're, they're strange. They're nothing like Christ. And I wonder if the world is looking in to the church of Pergamum at the time and to us today, what difference? What difference are, is your faith in Christ making? And to that church back then and to the churches, including us today, he says in verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Meaning this, these words applies to us today to him who overcomes i will give some of the hidden manna i will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it known only to him or her who receive receives it first of all he says repent i i that was the previous verse repent Repent means to make a U-turn, turn around from going your own stubborn ways and turn around and, and turn to me, run to me first and go my way. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, he says, it's not going to be a donkey that's going to oppose you from going your destructive way. It's not even going to be an angel with the sword stretched out to oppose you and maybe even slay you from violating my laws. But I myself, he says, with the double-edged sword in my mouth, will oppose you. I don't know about you, but the scariest thought, I'm a child of God, so I know he's not going to oppose me in this kind of manner, that he's going to oppose me with a strong discipline. But the scariest thought I have ever is that God would oppose me. The world can oppose me, and I think I'll be okay. But God, to oppose me and you? And that's what he says. If you continue on that track... I myself will stand between you and the world, and I will oppose you. But he says, those who will repent and hear my voice, I will give you two things. Number one, hidden manna. Hidden manna. Manna was, manna, the word manna means what is it? Like when, when it came down from heaven, they were in the wilderness, and they were hungry. It just fell, these white flakes, it fell, and they were able to eat that. What is it? it manna, manna. It was heavenly food that the angels ate. And Jesus said, when you, get, when you overcome and stay faithful, you're going to, I'm going to wait on you, as one of the parables says, and I'm going to gird up my loins because I'm going to get excited about serving you. Remember Psalm 23? He prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. And what Jesus is promising is that when you come in your weary, beaten body where you stay faithful to me, I'm going to quickly serve you and give you manna give you a taste of what my people tasted, but even better. And secondly, I'm going to give you a hidden name. A hidden name. Un written on a white stone, I'm going to write a, a nickname, perhaps, of who I think you are. A secret kind of nickname or title about, about what, what Jesus thinks you are. A, a good, positive name, of course. And only you can know it. I'll only share, share this secret with you. I don't know about you, but that excites me. This is a picture of intimacy. Only lovers tell secrets. Only intimate friends tell secrets. Shh, don't tell anyone. This is just for you. I would love to hear something like, Joe. You were faithful to me. Your name is faithfulness. I would love to hear that word. Not fruitful, not successful, but that I was faithful. And, and, and he says, shh, don't tell anyone. That's just, just between me and you. I'll be walking around with that white rock, and hopefully it's not too heavy, in my pocket throughout eternity. Because this is what Jesus thinks of me. You see, the reason why we compromise and try to assimilate and take the easy road, number one, it's because God is not on the throne. Your dreams, your wishes, your idols are on the throne. And we begin to believe that the end justifies the means. Whatever it takes, I'm going to achieve it because you don't have God in your life. For those of us who are believers, the reason why we drift and assimilate and compromise is because we have lost the sense of first love that, that, we, that we saw in the church of Ephesus. The sense of intimacy with Christ. Like that song says, looking for love in all the wrong places. Why? Because when we drift from Him, 
everything becomes enticing, everything becomes glamorous, everything becomes shiny. And it's only salt water. Salt water. Because when you drink these worldly salt water, you die quicker in your spirit. It gives you a temporary relief. But there's always room for repentance, he says here. And the only way that's going to sustain us, let me close, close. The only way that's going to sustain us from compromising and from standing for our faith is that you and I know the gospel, the good news. What is the good news to you? Is it that you and I were so lovable and forgivable that God couldn't help himself but sent his one and only son to die for you because you were so good already? No. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 that you and I were objects of his wrath, of his judgment, that we deserve the two double-edged sword that was coming out of Jesus' mouth, that we deserve his wrath and only his wrath. But God in his mercy... Gave, him, gave us his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to absorb the judgment of God for you and me. Not because we were so lovable, but because of his sheer mercy and grace. When you realize that, that's what's going to sustain you and uphold you during persecutions, during challenges and difficult times. That how can this God so great and holy take my place and die for me. And if this God in Christ would die for me, I would die and live for him. For those of you who are believers already, the thing that will sustain you and me from drifting and compromising and from standing up for Christ is that same gospel. Not something new and improved. Not a manual on spiritual warfare and how to really be a spiritual giant, but the same gospel that saved you will sustain you and keep you till the end. So remember and remind yourselves who God is, what he did, and to whom we belong. Let's pray. Would you take a moment? To resolve by faith in God's grace alone, Christ alone. That I will follow him through thick and thin. Not by my willpower, but in utter dependence on him. That when I fall, like Peter, I know Jesus is always praying, just as he prayed for Peter. Peter, after you fall, he knows that we're going to fall. What an amazing prayer of our Jesus, the high priest, sitting on the right hand of God, which means his same authority and power. And he intercedes day and night for us, saying, even when you fall, I will raise you up, I'll pick you up, so that you, you can encourage my brethren and sisters. That is the good news and the only hope that we have, that Jesus, who paid the price for us, will continue to provide and pray for us. Pray that prayer to Him. And renew your love relationship with Him. Father, we realize that the church, your people, and throughout the ages, and in some ways in this particular season of, of COVID-19 and racial tension and, and just the political climate of division and election and all these things just clamoring for our attention. Forgive us for the times that we have given ourselves to, the, to news and to what's happening and to this fleeting life on earth, a little dot, a speck in in the line of eternity. Forgive us for giving too much of our time, too much of our devotion 
to these fleeting things. And so little time to cultivate a love relationship with you, to obey you, to desire you above all, to treasure you, to worship and honor you no matter what. That we can do this together with the saints, Lord, not just individualistically, God, not just to make our religion and our faith so private. Forgive us for that too, Lord. We, we've, we've just so entitled and, and put walls around us that no one can speak truth and grace into our lives, that, that it's just whatever we think is right for us. We have given ourselves to the teachings of Balaam in that manner. Forgive us, God. Help our church to repent from those things. So that we may shine as salt and light, a city on a hill. God, that would draw people to you. Empower your church by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to remain faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. that manna in heaven. I know I do. I love food. Right? Heavenly food. 
allow? Does it entice you? Do you want that rock with the hidden name that only you and Jesus will know? Does that excite you? More than diamonds in this world, more than any jewelry, any gadgets, anything in this world, does that invite you? I, I hope it does. I hope that you meditate on those things. Because those are just tokens of Christ himself. And I hope that you would desire Christ above all. He didn't save us just for salvation, someone said. He saved us so we can have Christ. Love Christ more than the salvation package, heaven and his rewards. Let's love him for who he is, for his sake. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the amazing love of our Heavenly Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.